Good afternoon or evening, whatever it is. My name is Henry Beenan. I'm the President Emeritus of Northwestern University. And be, on behalf of the administration, I'd like to welcome you all to our new Kellogg Global Hub and an evening with the titans of nanotechnology presented by the National Science and Technology Metals Foundation. At Northwestern, we made an early bet on the promise of nanotechnology back in the year 2000 when we established the International Institute of Nano for Nanotechnology, or IIN, and it has paid off in remarkable ways for Northwestern, for our country, and even though it sounds grandiose, for the world. Uh, we now have ties through IIN, China, Singapore, Europe, Israel, among others. Today, the IIN is recognized as a global hub of excellence in the field and represents and unites over $1 billion in nanotechnology research, education, and supporting infrastructure. This allows us to attract outstanding faculty and students, engage with visionary donors and state and federal government to create research programs that use nanotechnology to meet important societal challenges and to benefit the world. Conceived of and directed by Chad Merkin, it has allowed us to attract world-class talent from all parts of the world, including the likes of Sam Stoop, who I think I helped recruit by tracking him down at a bar in DC. I don't know if Sam is here tonight, but it's a story we always tell. John Rogers, Terry Odom, Milan Merzik, whom I think at basketball games, Milan tried to get you to move north here uh, at the Bulls games. Will Dichtel and our recently minted Nobel laureate and speaker today, Sir Fraser Stoddard. <clears throat> I'm proud to have been involved in those recruitments and of course they were very important for Northwestern, to say the least. Almost every department affiliated with the IIN has seen a rise in ranking and has made Northwestern extraordinarily stronger and our reputation enhanced in the life sciences, chemistry, Feinberg School of Medicine, engineering, and has also created, through IIN, links between different units of the universities across disciplines and schools, which is also extraordinarily important in today's world. This important event, hosted by the National Science and Technology Metals Foundation, is a culmination of all these efforts and on behalf of Northwestern, I'd like to thank the foundation and especially Andy Rathman Noonan, their executive director. Thank you, Andy. <clears throat> Before we begin, there are a few people in the audience I'd like to recognize. In, an, in addition to a number of distinguished professors and emeritus professors in attendance, including the renowned members of tonight's panel, Mr. David Weinberg, who's with us tonight. David is a member of the IIN Executive Advisory Council, and he has been long-term member uh, and vice chair of Northwestern's Board of Trustees. Mark Ratner, our great friend and leader in chemistry and nanotechnology also here, a person who's played a critical role in building the Northwestern nanotech effort. Rosemary Schnell, Rosemary who has been a consistent nanotechnology enthusiast and strong supporter over the years. Jay Walsh, Jay was in front of me, uh, Northwestern's Vice President uh, for Research, also here tonight. Finally, Northwestern has a long history with the National Science and Technology Metals Foundation, and I'd like to recognize one of our own, Walter P. Murphy, and distinguished McCormick School Professor Emeritus, Jan Achenbach, Professor Achenbach, is one of the few people in the country 
who has received both the National Medal of Science and the National Medal of Technology. I didn't see Jan when I came in. Is it Jan, we are up here. Jan, thank you. <clears throat> thank you all for being part of this exciting evening and being with us. And at this time, I'll turn it over to Andy Rathman Noonan. Andy. Thanks a lot for those kind words. Um, hi, everyone. As you heard, my name is Andy Rathman Noonan. I'm the Executive Director of the National Science and Technology Medals Foundation. Um, you're probably wondering what I'm doing up here, and you probably want to hear from the talent that's going to be up here. So uh, bear with me for so a few short remarks. Um, first, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Northwestern, of course, the International Institute of Nanotechnology, and the Kellogg School of Business for hosting, here, hosting us here tonight. This building is absolutely beautiful, so thank you very much for that. Um, I also want to thank our sponsors, um, the United States Patent and Trademark Office, the National Science Foundation, and the Howard Hughes Medical Institute tonight. We would, tonight we would not, none of this would have been possible without their support. Our foundation was founded on the belief that scientific and technological advancement are powerful agents of positive change. This, we believe, is more true today than ever before. Um, in an effort to highlight the profound impact uh, science has had in all of our lives, our foundation champions the work and lives of America's greatest scientists and technologists. Tonight, we are fortunate, fortunate enough to hear from the men and women who are passionately working to change the world through nanotechnology, nanomedicine, and molecular architecture. Before I welcome our talented panel to the stage tonight, I would like to acknowledge a few other special guests with us uh, who are in attendance. Um, Joining us tonight are the esteemed members of the National Medal of Technology and Innovation Evaluation Committee. These are the individuals who recommend to the President of the United States the nominees for the National Medal of Technology and Innovation. Um, if you would please stand to be recognized, I'd really appreciate it. Um, Executive Director of the Lemelson Foundation, Dr. Carol Dahl. Uh, <laughs> New York University's Senior Vice Provost of Research, Dr. Paul Horn. National Medal of Science Laureate and President of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, Dr. Shirley Ann Jackson. <laughs> National Medal of Technology Innovation Laureate and University of Connecticut, Albert and Wilda Van Dusen, Distinguished Professor of Orthopedic Surgery, Dr. Cato Lorenzen. <laughs> National Medal of Technology Innovation Laureate, at Harvard University's Benjamin Pierce Professor of Technology and Public Policy and Professor of Physics, Dr. Cherry Murray. Uh, former director of the Johnson Space Center um, and chairperson of the National Medal of Technology and Innovation Evaluation Committee, Dr. Uh, Ellen Ochoa. <laughs> University of Akron President Emeritus, Dr. Luis Perenza. <laughs> president of the National Academy of Inventors and University of South Florida Senior Vice President for Research, Innovation, and Knowledge Enterprise, Dr. Paul Sandberg. National Medal of Technology Innovation Laureate and inventor of the digital camera, Mr. Steve Sasson. <laughs> and recently retired president and CEO of the Nita Borg Institute for Women and Technology, Dr. Telly Whitney. <laughs> All right, now to the main event. Let's talk about our panel here. Um, unfortunately, I've got a bit of bad news. Uh, Dr. Langer had some unfortunate travel issues and could not be with us tonight. But um, we can't despair too much. We've got an unbelievable group of individuals who are going to be speaking. So um, I'd like to you know, give a brief background on who will be uh, speaking here tonight. First guest is um, Dr. Sanjita Bhatia, the How a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator, director of the Marble Center for Cancer Nanomedicine, and the John J. Dorothy Wilson Professor at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Trained as a physician and engineer, Dr. Bhatia has developed technologies that interface living cells with synthetic systems, enabling new applications in tissue regeneration and stem cell, uh, stem cell differentiation, medical diagnostics, and drug delivery. Our next guest is Dr. Chad Merkin, Director of Northwestern's International Institute of Nanotechnology and the George B. Rathman Professor of Chemistry in the Weinberg College of Arts and Sciences. A world-renowned nanoscience expert, Merkin discovered and developed spherical nucleic acids, dip pen nanolithography, and numerous other contributions to supramolecular chemistry. He is one of the elite group of scientists elected into all three branches of the U.S. National Academies. 
The third member of tonight's panel is Sir Fraser Stoddard. Dr. Stoddard is a Board of Trustees Professor of Chemistry at Northwestern. He received the 2016 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for des the design and syn synthesis of molecular machines. By introducing the mechanical bond into chemical compounds, Stoddard became one of the few chemists to open up a new field of chemistry in the past 25 years. And finally, tonight's discussion will be moderated by University of Toronto Distinguished Professor Shanna Kelly. Dr. Kelly works in a variety of areas spanning biophysical, uh, bioanalytical chemistry, chemical biology, and nanotechnology. She has new methods for tracking molecular and cellular analytics with unprecedented sensitivity. So please join me in a round of applause as we welcome all of them to the stage. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm very pleased to be part of this event tonight. We're fortunate to have a panel here, our titans of, of nanotechnology. I think this panel was, was really very aptly named. Uh, what you have here uh, is a panel of, of trailblazers that have really taken nanotechnology from a very nascent field a couple decades ago to where it is today. A lot of exciting uh, discoveries being made and, and lots of very interesting applications uh, in a number of areas. You may be aware that it was in the late 50s that a physicist named Richard Feynman first mentioned some of the ideas and concepts underlying nanotechnology, but at the time these were really just ideas and, and a conceptual framework. Um, it took really quite a few decades before we had the type of analytical tools and imaging tools required to really observe phenomena on the nanoscale. Um, and so here we are now with, with lots of exciting um, experimental systems emerging. Uh, our panel members tonight have pioneered new approaches to the manipulation of materials and, and nanomaterials and also chemical systems. Uh, and as I've mentioned, they're working in a variety of uh, exciting application areas. My own research program at the University of Toronto has absolutely been inspired by the, the types of, of discoveries that our panel members uh, here tonight have made. Um, I'm very excited to, to be here and to be moderating the discussion. And I'd like to start the discussion tonight um, by asking each of our panel members, just in their own words, to talk a little bit about their expertise and their, their background and the type of, of research that they're working on today. So, Professor Stoddard, would you start? Well, my background is uh, very firmly uh, in science. Um, it, uh, then, after um, my introduction through um, my high school and uh, University of Edinburgh. Uh, I majored in American parlance and chemistry. Um, I had to serve, I would say, not 10,000 hours, but uh, something like 20,000 hours uh, in order to get myself to a point where I uh, could be um, creative in a transformative way in relation to, as it turned out, artificial molecular machinery. The turning point came uh, when I um, had a three year sabbatical at uh, Imperial Chemical Industries uh, corporate laboratory and it was there that I discovered the building blocks and uh, who would have guessed uh, it was a weed killer, uh, Paraquat, also known as methyl biologin, chemical much used by many, uh, that uh, we introduced into our, uh, as it were, um, building of uh, molecular machinery. And then it took some 35 years uh, of, uh, first of all, uh, laying the ground rules for molecular recognition, uh, playing a big role in the invention of the uh, mechanical bond, and then using that mechanical bond in the context of things called rotaxanes and catenanes to get movement uh, within molecules, and then ultimately take that movement through to uh, the design and synthesis of artificial molecular machines. Well, that's a hard act to follow. <laughs> Good evening. Um, so uh, I'm uh, trained as an engineer and a physician. And I got started actually in high school. I'm the daughter of Indian immigrants. And my dad said to me, you should be an engineer. And uh, I had no idea what engineering was. <laughs> um, but I went, set out to learn. Um, and at the time, biomedical engineering was a new field. And I got very interested in how engineering technologies could be applied to medicine. 
And so over the course of my education, I trained uh, in engineering, got my bachelor's, my master's, my PhD at MIT, and also then a medical degree, um, and, uh, and specialized in how miniaturization technologies, so sort of tiny tools from semiconductor manufacturing, could be useful in medicine. And around the time I became an assistant professor, um, the year 2000, it was a really interesting moment for nanotechnology because it was the time when top-down fabrication um, became able to make transistor features smaller than 100 nanometers. <coughs> and if you're interested in the human body, um, all of a sudden that becomes really very enabling because it turns out that there are 100 nanometer and smaller windows all over the body. The kidney um, is a 5 nanometer filter, the liver is a 100 nanometer filter. Um, and for me, that really started an, an adventure of how nanoscale materials could um, be used in medicine. Well, so the reason I'm here, I think, I always say distills down to two things, collisions and, and, and connections. Um, you never know where you're going to end up in life and, and what you're ultimately going to pursue. But in, in high school, I, I liked science, but I didn't have this great passion to move into science. I was going to go to um, college. and. I had three brothers, one was a geologist, one was a physicist, and one was a uh, biologist turned medical doctor spine surgeon that left chemistry. So I enrolled in chemistry, didn't want to compete with them. Uh, did fairly well in chemistry, then uh, had a great experience. This was the collision. Uh, went to Penn State and worked for a, a synthetic chemist there in, in a graduate program and realized, hey, this is really cool stuff. I like this a lot, and I think I could be pretty good at it. Uh, decided to change my whole life plan. I was going to go to medical school and said, no, I'm going to get a PhD in chemistry. Got my PhD, moved on to MIT. Another collision was a guy named Mark Wrighton. Uh, he was one of the first to, uh, at the time, really look at uh, the consequences of miniaturization in chemical systems. But he was at the right place, but at the wrong time, because we didn't have the tools at that time to really talk about building nanostructures routinely. So he was looking at microscale systems. And now I start my independent career at Northwestern. I'm a chemist looking for something new to do, and machines are coming, becoming available, commercially available, that allow you to not only see atoms, but to move them around. They're commercial tools. I realize this is going to be a big thing, and I, I should get good at it. And then I realize that chemistry is a big part of this, that we have to be able to make these structures uh, and, and then visualize them and use them for different types of purposes. And then the third collision was sitting up here in the front row, Mark Ratner. We, we looked at this, we were trying to build another arm of chemistry effectively, and, and, and we said, you know, how could we do this? Well, we could do it around nanotechnology. That wasn't even talked about. But we had all these chemists that were interested in, in miniaturization and miniaturized systems, so we said, let's build this thing called, I think it was a Center for Nanofabrication and Molecular Self-Assembly. It's Ryan Hall over here. Uh, and then we said, let's not just do this for chemistry, let's do this for real. Let's begin to draw in all sorts of different people uh, from different disciplines and really do this in grand style. And that was kind of the birth of, of what you heard about call, called the IIN. And it really was a very important part of my career because it took me down paths. I was trained really as a synthetic chemist, but I could kind of see all these connections of how you could use chemistry to impact biology, medicine, energy research, and many of the things that we currently do today. So I think you've, you've heard already that one of the very special and I, I think fairly unique things about nanotechnology is that it draws in researchers from all different disciplines. We all come from various backgrounds. We bring our tools. We have a, a, a shared set of, of interests and, and applications that we work away on. Um, but this is really an all-encompassing field. It's not just chemistry. It's not just engineering. It's not just biology. It's all of these things coming together. So. Um, we worked our way this way, uh, talking about backgrounds. We'll work our way back. And Chad, I just hope that maybe you could talk to us about and give us your perspective on the discoveries that really catalyzed the birth of the field. What were the things that really started things off? And then zoom out of, you know, a couple decades. Where, where are we now? What are the most exciting things happening in nanotechnology? Yeah, it's kind of interesting. We, we were actually asked a similar question, I think, 25 years ago or 20 years ago on Extension 720, the AM radio station that very few people listened to it. I didn't even know it existed, but Mark and I sat there for an hour answering these types of questions. Very <laughs> tough back then because it was all kind of looking forward because much of it hadn't been developed. Um, you have to remember that nanotech really came from, in large part, science fiction, right? Uh, inspired by science fiction writers. Isaac Asimov's Fantastic Voyage is, is, is a nice example. 
what made it a, a transition to real science, I think, was really the invention of new analytical tools, things like the electron microscope that allowed you to visualize structures on the nanometer length scale, the scanning tunneling microscope, the atomic force microscope that allowed you to not only see atoms, you know, I was taught as a high schooler, you can't see atoms. Well, you can not only see them, you can image them and you can move them around and build structures one atom at a time now. And anybody can do that. These instruments now are, are, are commercially available and they populate labs all over the world. Uh, incredible transition in a relatively short period of time. And then it's the realization that chemistry and material science are really important here. The fact that you can, if you can build structures and begin to think beyond the normal type of, 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 of chemistry where you're really building small molecular systems to building these intermediate sized structures. You know, much of the interest in, modern interest in nanotechnology is not because it's so small. You know, chemistry dealt with small structures for a long time. It's actually on the length scale of biology, but building chemical systems on the length scale of biology is, is a difficult thing to do. Those are really big macromolecular systems, the types of machines that he talks about. The, these are incredible structures. I was a grad student when he made one of the first machines, and I remember a, a professor running down, a, a guy named Bill Horrocks, the, the halls of Penn State, saying, I can't believe this guy threaded the needle. He, he, he made a molecule where he put another molecule through it and, 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 and thought of all the crazy things, first of all, that you could do with that. You know, it opened up a whole new way of thinking about matter. And, and, and so, to me, it's these analytical tools and chemical tools that really made the, the, the field real and allowed us now to systematically begin to think about, how, okay, how can I restructure matter from the bottom up as opposed to the top down, building things, atoms at a time or small molecules at a time, and taking them to a size where they have properties that we've never seen before. And so you could begin to map out those properties. That was the science. And then the technology part, of course, is once you discover materials with new properties, you say, how do I use that to make the world better? How do I solve major technological problems? So there was this kind of natural evolution uh, in, in terms of the development of the field. But to me, a lot of the modern age of nanotechnology really happened over the last three decades. And I would say you and I were at the right place at the right time. <laughs> yeah, maybe Sangeeti, you can pick up on that and talk a little bit about the, the biology nanotechnology interface. Sure, yeah. So I think um, you heard so nicely from Chad about how material properties change. Um, at the nanoscale, so their electronic properties, their optical properties, they, um, they turn colors that they aren't at the macro scale. And what's really fascinated me and many of us, I think, is that their interface with biology actually changes. So a single receptor is a few nanometers. The way cells take in those um, materials changes in a size-dependent way. The way they get in and out of the body actually depends on their nanoscale shape and charge. Um, and, and a size and material properties, whether they're soft or hard. Um, and so, so in thinking about what, how you can change the world with these materials, um, if you're trained in biology and medicine, it becomes very clear that some of the grand challenges in human health might be now um, enabled by these advances. So pick, for example, oncology, cancer. Um, we know today that we could treat 50% uh, of the cancers if we just did what we know about already, which is stopping smoking, screening, and vaccinating patients. But the other 50% we can't treat today, and we probably need better tools for early detection of cancers. Um, and that becomes a grand challenge that you can stand up for nanotechnology because it turns out that now these materials are so small that they can travel through your bloodstream and look for cancer. And so now we've flipped the whole paradigm um, and, and that happens in medicine over and over again for infections and antibiotic resistance, um, for all kinds of non-communicable diseases where we just didn't have the tools um, using you know, drugs, um, which has been the mainstay of medicine. Now nanotechnology has become this enabling new frontier. And Professor Stoddard, when you were talking about the original development of your molecular machines, and Chad was talking a little bit about this too, that was really before we talked about nanotechnology, right? And you were visualizing molecular motions and the way that mole molecules could be designed. Can you tell us a little bit about the transition and the way that people have, have taught, thought about these types of systems as we're more comfortable thinking about things at the nanoscale? Well, the, the, the first point I really want to make is that I'm old enough to remember when uh, scientists and uh, engineers were siloed. And uh, it was even worse than that. In chemistry, we had labels like organic, inorganic, physical, theoretical, la la la. 
and uh, we did not talk to each other. And this was the 60s and the 70s. And then I think what was transformative uh, in chemistry was the work of uh, two people um, on the back of um, the third one. I must mention the third one first. Uh, Charles Peterson at um, the DuPont Research Laboratories in Wilmington, Delaware, introduced to the world, um, and nobody knew who he was. He was 65 and he had just made this wonderful discovery of uh, big rings, and he called them crown ethers and they were spattered with oxygens and so they interacted with metal ions, they interacted with organic species. And this led um, Don Cram at UCLA, with whom I had a warm uh, relationship from about 1976 onwards, to establish the field of host gas chemistry. And then on the other side of the pond in Strasbourg, Jean-Marie Lane uh, established the same kind of principles. He called it supramolecular chemistry, if we want to put it into simple language, chemistry beyond the molecule. Well, all of this was about um, molecular recognition. And what it did was it united, uh, first of all, chemistry. And that meant that by the end of, uh, we will say, the 70s, going into the 80s, I saw it as chemistry was ready to in as it were, uh, in, get its, its, its arms around uh, what, what Chad was talking about and uh, what we've also heard um, uh, most recently here, um, the, the fact that uh, the uh, advances in the technology uh, that was made by the physicists, all the uh, uh, <coughs> electron microscopes and uh, STMs, scanning tunneling microscopes and uh, atomic force microscopes, this, this then was the final act of reunification, I think, of science and engineering. And so for me, it has been a huge delight because uh, I was very much uh, at odds with the, the siloed situation that I met at the beginning of my career. And so it's just been absolutely wonderful to watch how it has all sort of come together. And in the case of my own science, aided and abetted uh, the, um, as it were, playing a part, I wasn't the only person, playing a part in the um, invention of the mechanical bond, which, you know, to put it in context, is a new bond that really took off in 1990 in chemistry, and it's a bond that's every bit as uh, stable as the classical chemical bond. It's as stable as the weakest chemical bond in the molecule. And so it just rejuvenates chemistry, and this is the great thing about chemistry that I want to emphasize this evening. Chemistry is like uh, painting or sculpture or uh, composing music or, or um, uh, what else could be, writing a novel. Uh, it, it's a very, very creative science, and so this creativity, I think, came together with all these advances that came from uh, mainly the physicist. Uh, to, to uh, allow us to uh, get us to where we are today. And so it became, dare I say it, relatively easy, but only because I had some spectacular students. I mean, let's not miss this one out. Uh, it's not all Fraser Stoddart. It's very little Fraser Stoddart. It is really all about the 500 uh, really remarkable young people driven from 50 countries um, over um, 50 years. And uh, that's been the real joy of it. Well, maybe, maybe just to build on that, I couldn't agree more that it's, it's really a delight. It's such an exciting time, I mean, for the students in the crowd. I think the, the convergence of all these disciplines at this moment when you have the tools to make molecules and see them is, um, is just incredibly fun. <laughs> and some of the things that I, you know, have come out of all of our labs, and I'm sure many of yours, have been um, you know, what we would call serendipity. Um, so the materials that I was just talking about, we were trying to make <coughs> MRI materials for, we were trying to make contrast agents for MRI machines. So we were trying to make super paramagnetic materials that would go into cancer and tell you where it was invading. And whenever the animals had cancer, the bladder would light up. And 
And we were like, what the heck is this? First of all, the students came and they said, what is this? I said, well, that's the bladder. I went to medical school. I know that's the bladder. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> um, and then we had kind of this aha moment where he's like, oh, the materials are getting activated by the tumor, and this thing is being shed, and the kidney is a five nanometer filter, and it's concentrating in the bladder, and oh, we've invented a non-invasive diagnostic. Um, and like that's just an example, but all of us have these like fun serendipity moments that just come because we are creatively sort of tinkering um, in our labs. Yeah. Well, and, and I think the serendipitous moments, the breaking down of the, the silos, that typically happens at really special institutions. It takes a certain type of, of environment to really foster that. Uh, I think the institution that we're all at today is one of the places Northwestern is certainly recognized as a leader in the field of nanotechnology. And Chad, maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Why is the, the environment here really fostered this, this field? Well, I, you know, part of it has to do with uh, history. Uh, they, they, they built a, uh, a building here a long time ago with the idea of putting all of science and engineering. It's called tech. It's one of the largest, at the time, it was one of the largest standalone science buildings in the U.S. might have been the largest one. And uh, that meant that people ran into one another from different disciplines on a routine basis, and, and that kind of led to a, uh, a highly interactive place just from the start. But historically, then, we began to really capitalize on that and, and build centers that would draw on expertise from different types of, of fields, and, and the IIN is, is, is a prime example of that. And to me, that was one of the greatest gifts given to science, the whole wave of nanotechnology. I'm, I'm amazed when some people push back on it and say, well, you know, we're not really into that. It's not, not a great thing to do. You know, because, I mean, translation, I don't do that. Um, but, <laughs> but, 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 you know, I think of my own field. I, I came from, from chemistry, and it was, it was a purist, like, like Fraser described. I and mean, we only did chemistry, and we only worked with people like ourselves. Uh, that was just the way you were trained back then, and you became really good at making these molecules that, in certain cases, people didn't care about other than the three people that were working in that lab. Uh, very important part, you were contributing because you were you know, being trained, you were, you were learning how to make things that didn't exist. And then we had this, this rise of nanotech where you had to learn new areas. You had to step outside your comfort zone. You had to connect what your, your skills with engineering. You had to connect your skills with biology, with medicine. And I think that's where many of the most exciting advances take place. Um, and so at Northwestern, it was pretty easy to do because we had this history of, of, of interaction and, and not everybody embraced it, but a lot of people embraced it. And Henry talked about um, how you know, we built it here, but he, he was in large part responsible for it because we went to him and said, hey, this is going to be big. Uh, it's perfect for what we do here at Northwestern. Um, let's not just dabble in it. Let's make a big bet and build it fast, and if we build it, and get f a, a, a large and good fast, then we will be drivers of this field. And I, I think history has said that was a pretty good bet. And as he said, almost everybody affiliated with the institute, I mean, chemistry went from, I don't know, it was the 14th ranked department when I started here, um, and roughly in the top 15 or so in terms of size. Today, it's, it's the largest chemistry department in the country. It's bigger than Berkeley, with half the faculty, and it went from uh, that ranking to one through five, depending upon which ranking you look at. Uh, that's just almost unheard of. Uh, now, that's not all due to nanotech, but a large fraction of it was because many of the chemists and other folks embraced nanotech, and, and, and that ultimately paid big dividends. That was true of a lot of other fields, material science, uh, biology, now medicine. Is a, we're having a huge wave moving from, you know, I'd say nanotech started really in electronics, being driven by the concept of Moore's Law. Everybody understood that miniaturization played a big role there in computation and electronics. But then once you understood that, that this was more than just making things small, it was that everything when miniaturized is new. You discover, I, I can create all sorts of new materials that have new properties that can impact energy, can impact medicine, can impact biology. And then it just leads to more and more connections, and, and now some of the largest and strongest connections are, are between this campus and, and, and the medical school campus. I think the, the universities across the U.S. And, and also internationally, the ones that have become leaders in nanotechnology, they're not just strong in one discipline. They have strength in chemistry. They have strength in engineering. They have strength in medicine. And that really that allows the convergence that's, that's so important to, to nanotechnology. Um, so maybe we, we can talk about uh, some of the, the challenges where nanotechnology has had a big impact already. So what, what do you see as some of the 
it's really still early, right? We're just a, a couple decades in. So, um, Professor Stoddard, can you think of a, an area where you think nanotechnology is, has already made a, a big impact? Well, I'm probably not the best person on the platform to address that particular uh, question because, um, you know, I've not uh, veered as much as uh, my two colleagues have into the uh, medical arena. But um, the um, inventions that uh, I've been part of bringing to the uh, marketplace, I think, are, um, as was said when the um, announcement of the 2016 Nobel Prize in chemistry was um, coming out of Stockholm uh, was for fundamental science. And I, I do want to put a plea in tonight for fundamental science and uh, to back up uh, what I say with a few uh, observations. You know, most countries in the world, including the US, have backed away in the last few decades from uh, supporting uh, people rather than uh, they prefer to support projects. Well, you know, I think it is very well um, documented through time, and I'm talking about a century or more, that the supporting of people, 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 this, this point was made by Vannevar Bush uh, after um, World War II. He was the um, science advisor to um, uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt, that, uh, and this was very much the way the National um, Science Foundation worked at that time was, was to identify people and really support them. And so what I would like to see uh, would be for the future of uh, nanotechnology more, um, as it were, emphasis put in the hands of uh, people, including the students. Now, I'm in a lab situation where, okay, I've got uh, one uh, piece of science that uh, everyone seems to know about, but what I want to emphasize is that uh, on a daily basis, because um, we're not a one-trick pony, um, there are a dozen different projects going on amongst the maybe 30 students, uh, postdocs that uh, are affiliated with my group, and they have enormous freedom. And th this I've got to thank Northwestern for, because it's an incredible institution where you don't have to have the contact between the so-called PIs, the professors. The students are effectively um, able to and are courageous enough to strike out and get involved in collaborations. And so in the 10 years, the decade or so that I've been here, I've collaborated with more than a dozen of my colleagues at this university uh, in a big way. And it's all been driven by the students. Uh, I think there's this famous phrase, I'm not quite sure who invented it, that we are successful because we hunt in packs, right? <laughs> and uh, this hunting in packs also leads to serendipitous discoveries, and I think we're going to get there quite shortly if I know uh, what's on your agenda, um, that quite out of the blue, I have students who make, first of all, a discovery of the first and only metal organic framework that is totally edible, that is green, and um, can be used in very, very many different uh, areas, in home care, personal care, pharmaceuticals, food, petrochemicals, you name it. And actually sitting over there uh, is Usri Botros, the CEO of this company. And in less than two years, he's just played absolute magic. 10 days ago, um, he was um, at the event here in Chicago that gave the company a innovation award. It has been so spectacular in that period of time. Another uh, quite serendipitous discovery is one that could lead to the um, mining of gold. Well, not the mining of it, the, the, the isolation of it after mining it. Uh, at the moment, 83% uh, of it is carried out using sodium cyanide. And it gets worse than that. The other 17% is mercury. The world needs to have uh, new ways of isolating gold. And we have it. Um, that's another startup company. And both of these uh, companies are based on another thing that we should mention in a fundamental sense that comes out of nanotechnology, and that is emergence. You can take the bits and pieces, and they won't do 
what you would like to do in a grandiose scheme, but when you put them together, they're magic. And this is emergence at work. So I, I've covered maybe too many topics, but uh, I, I just, you know, I'm excited by the fact that uh, nanotechnology has given us this opportunity to revolutionize the way science and engineering is done. And I'm so happy that it happened halfway through my scientific career. Wonderful. I think that those are, are great statements about impact. Uh, Sangeeta, how about at the nanotechnology medicine uh, interface? What do you think some of the early wins are for nanotechnology? So I think some of the early wins are actually um, just not widely known. <laughs> for example, there's a technology called liposomal drug delivery where we package drugs in lipid particles and we're able to deliver them and they're safe when they wouldn't have been otherwise um, and they're very effective chemotherapy medicines. And those same technologies now, I think, are incredibly po well poised to action something that you might have heard about, um, which is genome editing. So this idea that there's a whole new way to interact. We know the sequence of the genome now. We can go in and edit it with something like CRISPR, or we can silence its gene products with things like RNA interference. It's like a whole exciting time that's come out of biology where we can manipulate the genome or its gene products and treat diseases. <coughs> diseases. And it turns out that being able to do that in patients is a delivery problem. And the solution to the delivery problem is nanomedicine. Um, and so it's sort of right on the cusp of this sort of perfect solution for this really exciting time. I will say my plea for the future of, of um, nanotechnology, in addition to fundamental science, is also that we really need a more diverse workforce. So um, there are, I think, not enough of us that look, that look like me. So um, a daughter of immigrants, woman engineer, you know, 12% of the engineering workforce in the U.S. is women. Um, and it's an amazing, I see lots of um, young women in the crowd. This is an amazing, fun profession. I have two young daughters and a husband scientist, and I have, like, the best life. And so you should choose this. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll stop there. I would second that. I don't think there's a better job. But uh, I'll also echo a little bit about what Fraser said. I mean, at Northwestern, we, 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 although we focus on technology, too, uh, we think it's actually an important part of the whole IIN uh, principle. <coughs> it's everything's grounded in basic research, you know, asking why, trying to figure out uh, why when you miniaturize something its properties are different. And it requires so many different people to figure that out. Uh, but then we, we th also think it's important to make the connection, to, to, to translate, to, to once, we, you know, once we identify a new phenomenon, how can we actually take advantage of that to develop technologies that make a difference? So we've built a, a very strong ecosystem that, that involves translation. And uh, since the, the founding of the IAN, we now have 23 companies that we've started and over a billion dollars worth of venture capital that's come into the area. It's completely changed the whole way we think about uh, science and translating that science to technologies that matter. That's led to a lot of interesting products, too. I've been involved in companies that have produced uh, technologies that are now used in half the world's hospitals for diagnosing disease. We developed a, a technology through a company called Nanosphere, which was then bought by uh, Luminex. It turns out to be the, the, the largest source of their revenue today. It's a public company. Uh, and uh, they produce a, a system called the Verigene system that uh, diagnoses disease rapidly at the point of use. Uh, it was one of the first examples of uh, nanotech being translated to medical diagnostics and, and used broadly. Why is it important? Well, it turns out it met a, a really critical need. It took us a long time to figure out what that need was, and it, it, it turned out it was sepsis. So uh, in, in terms of bloodstream infections, you need to know quickly. You can't wait three days. They were waiting three days to, die, to, to effectively figure out whether a person has sepsis. What that meant was they were saying, okay, we think you have it, therefore we're going to put you on $21,000 worth of antibiotics just in case you do, and then we'll figure out three days from now whether you really do or don't. That's not good doctoring. So this technology was really important because it allowed you to rapidly screen immediately and figure out who had it, who didn't, and if they had it, what they were infected with. So what antibiotics you should be treated with. That's lowering costs, better treatment, and, and ultimately, you know, better for, for everybody involved. And, and you know, the, the lesson from my standpoint, both as a scientist and entrepreneur, was, well, you've got to figure these things out quickly because we, we spent a lot of money and a lot of time going through that particular process and translating it from the university. And it took almost 14 years to get to that state. But now it's a technology that's broadly used. She talked a little bit about medicines. 
there are lots of medicines. There are, I think, over 20 different uh, medicines uh, that, that are, are nanotype drugs now. Uh, I would call them relatively simple uses of nanotechnology. Braxane is a good example. She used doxorubicin, I think, as an example in the liposomal case. Uh, both chemotherapeutic agents. These turned out to be big drugs, and, and they impact a lot of people. The effects are minor, and I would call it kind of a dumb use of nanotechnology, important outcome, but kind of uh, not, not really sophisticated design. Maybe a lot first of the generation. yeah, first generation, yeah. So 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 a lot of the new structures, yeah. yeah. She's a diplomat. <laughs> a lot of the new structures that are coming out, I think, are, are really taking exam uh, taking advantage of rational design, learning how to build these big macromolecular systems, and understanding how you chemically adjust them to optimize performance. And many of those are now going through the clinic, and we're seeing you know significant shots on goal, which I think will continue to pay dividends on the medical side of things. On the electronic side, we have an entire industry based upon nanotechnology. Microelectronics is now nanoelectronics. So every computer you make, every electronic device, that's a product of nanotechnology. Optics, same type of thing. In the areas of catalysis, you look in the chemical industry, in the oil industry, processing chemicals requires the ability to use oftentimes particles as catalysts. And the understanding of how to make those particles, shape them, and control their chemical content is really enabling because it can be the difference between a, a lousy catalyst or a great catalyst. And so a lot of what we've learned on the basic science side of things has fed that particular uh, developmental effort. And I think we'll continue to see that over the years to come. So we've talked about some of the early wins for nanotechnology. Uh, I know we have a, a lot of trainees in the audience and, and people that are maybe contemplating coming into the field. We should talk a bit about the, the grand challenges, what problems are, are left to, to solve for the, the next generation. Um, Professor Stoddard, do you, do you have a grand challenge for, for us? Well, that, uh, that's a very tough one. Um, so when I left uh, Edinburgh in 1967 to get on a jet plane for the first time in my life at 25 and fly to Canada for three years to carry out a postdoc, my professor said to me, and I didn't quite know what he was getting at until many years afterwards, whatever you do, Stoddart, tackle a big problem. And so the advice that I give to my students uh, increasingly is, um, that um, you need to go out, if you want to leave your mark on science and technology, nanotechnology or whatever, into this uh, very big jungle and say, I'm not going to go down just the beaten tracks. Then there are many of them. I'm going to, um, after a period of apprenticeship, and for me it was 20 years, and you know, I think people have got to be patient in this respect, but after a period of apprenticeship, to actually to have the courage to do your very best. And it may involve uh, forays into a few different uh, potentially big problems, but uh, to, to, to get your eye on something that um, somehow is not center stage. It's um, something that um, maybe undoubtedly will have been mentioned, because there's no first in science. There's always been somebody there before you that, um, for some reason or another, just as it was with the mechanical bond, it hadn't been developed. And so it was a great opportunity for me at the time. That was my big problem that uh, you know, my professor uh, had told me to focus on. But what, what then is needed is, is for the person who wants to leave their mark on science. And you know, I really do think a lot of our big advances in science are very much focused on individual people. It's for the people who are going to take over the um, baton from here on, the young people out in the audience there, is to identify a big problem and then have the courage to stay with it. And they need a lot of courage because you will know if you're being successful. There will be a lot of critical comment. Um, there will be damning comment, and you need, as I've often said, the height of an elephant at that stage to be able to uh, survive. But within yourself, uh, you're getting the message that you have done something different, and uh, the, the, the sad thing is that we're all human beings, and human beings don't like change, and there's no exception among scientists and engineers and nanotechnologists. Um, if it is really new, then uh, 
the uh, signal that you will get is uh, that um, uh, you're making some people uncomfortable. But that's a good signal. And that's when you put your foot on the accelerator and you go to show that this idea is uh, worthy of uh, being um, uh, <coughs> built upon. And so that means a lot of hard work for many hours of uh, uh, dedication on the part of students to actually bring it home forcibly and then the world will recognize it. So that, that's a more general comment as to what will be specifically happening in 30 years from now. I don't want to go there because, uh, you know, physicist uh, Lord Kelvin in 1885 said there would never be manned flight. Wow. How wrong he got it, yeah? <laughs> 1903, the Wright brothers come along. 1928, Bill Bryson records in a book one summer when the Pride of St. Louis, I think, went from New Jersey across to Paris to be welcomed by a quarter of a million people that the half-life of a pilot was only eight days. I came back uh, earlier today from Rio de Janeiro. Actually, there were two contraptions. One got me to Houston and another one got me to Chicago. There are 12,000 of these contraptions in the air at any one time now. You put 200 people in each of them and you've got two and a half million people it's half the population of my native country, Scotland, is in the air at any one time. <laughs> okay? So this is the kind of thing that can happen in just a century. And I think it'll be something of this magnitude that the younger people in the audience will witness in, if you like, nanotechnology. Uh, you need, he needs to finish that timeline. He told me an incredible statistic. In 2018, Fraser Stoddart logs 400,000 miles on your... No, no, just 330. <laughs> it's it's going to be... <laughs> okay, you're a piker. It, it's going to be half, <laughs> half a million this year, and I'm, I'm paying for it at the moment. <laughs> the body's objecting to it. <laughs> well, Sangita and Chad, what, what are the grand challenges on the, the medical side? Sure, yeah. I think, um, so I'm glad you, you mentioned medicine because I think for me, I, I have a conversation with my students a lot who are, are worried about their futures. I think they feel like science is crowded. And um, they, my trainees, like many of you I'm sure, are, are um, they want to be really strategic and they want to make good decisions. And, um, and, and I'm always telling them really unhelpful things like follow the most interesting problem. <laughs> and, um, and, and the one piece of advice I think which is, which is <coughs> never going to be wrong from a medical perspective is, is when you feel like the field is crowded, look at the clinic and look at the patients because there are unsolved grand challenges all over medicine and the population is aging and it's only getting, there's a, a, a bigger wave coming and not just here, but around the world. So if you look at cancer, which I, you know, where I know the statistics better, cancer kills more people every year than HIV, TB, and malaria combined. And by 2030, 80% of those deaths will be in low and middle income countries. There is not vaccination. There is a lot of smoking. There are not the screening programs like colonoscopy and mammogram that we take for granted here. Um, and, and so what that means is that's a grand challenge for the future where you think about how can I detect these diseases early without steady electricity or clean water or physician on site or surgical suite. Um, and, and, you know, from a sort of problem rich environment perspective, that, that's plenty of blue sky. So um, it's not crowded. You just have to look a little broader. Let me, let me give you two examples, one, one in the non-medical and then one in the medical side of things. Um, you know, I think nanotechnology has actually created this grand challenge. It, it, I started by saying that, that everything is new and miniaturized. Every bulk material, regardless of what it is, when you shrink it down, is different. Um, that's empowering, right, because it opens up this ability to begin to study structure function relationships in unusual ways. But from a chemistry and material science way, it creates an incredible challenge because if you think of the periodic table, you know, we have roughly 100 plus elements. 
Um, 90 of them are, are useful, not radioactive in terms of conventional type uh, uh, syntheses. You think of all the combinations and the importance of that, that leads to all the things that we, we make and characterize in the lab all the time. If you think historically, right, from a civilization standpoint, um, we've, uh, over the years, had entire ages based upon the discovery of new materials. Stone Age, the Bronze Age, living through the Silicon Age right now. Uh, we've looked at such a s tiny number of the possibilities. First, when you take into account the combinations of elements, but then when you take into account that everything, when combined in a certain way and scaled from one to 100 nanometers, is different from one another, we've looked at less than 0.1 percent. And that alone is a grand challenge, a little bit like what we've experienced in the biological realm. An enormous number of possibilities, and although I think we're all proud of all the things that we've developed based upon materials discovery over the last couple of centuries, if we could dramatically accelerate the pace of, of, of discovery and identify the winners from the losers, the structures that really make a difference, that would completely transition uh, what we call modern uh, civilization. It would create the next set of ages. And, and so I think that alone is one grand challenge. How do we actually do that? How do we process the data, figure out how to make the structures, and then ultimately use them? On the medical side of things, um, I'm a big believer on, on, in, in, in terms of the development of nanomedicines. I, I really think that we're going to see uh, new medicines that really allow us to, to fight disease in, in, in not just other ways, but better ways. And if you think of, of the pharmaceutical industry, we've gone through two major waves of pharmaceutical development. Uh, everybody knows small molecules have been important. Chemistry played a big role, aspirin, statins. Uh, we are living through the biologics age, right, where eight of the top ten drugs are biologics. They're based upon peptides and proteins. Many people believe that the next age will involve nucleic acids, short snippets of DNA and RNA as medicines. Um, that's possible because we've gone through the, the hard work of learning how to make these structures. We know a lot about pathways based upon the Human Genome Project and all the sequencing that's gone on. But we have to figure out ways of getting those structures to the tissues and cells that matter. And that's where being able to take these types of architectures and restructure them and design them so that they can travel through the body and go to specific locations so that you get very targeted effects is going to play a very big role. And I think what we're going to see over the next couple of decades are a whole series of shot on goals that are going to lead to the establishment of a whole new field of therapeutic development based upon nucleic acids. And much of it's going to be enabled because of advances in the development of nanomaterials that allow you to do that. Okay. So I've asked my questions. Uh, I think now we have some time for the audience to ask their questions. Uh, we have folks with microphones that are ready to hand one to you if you have a question. Thank you for your tremendous insights. This is a challenge to all three of you. Could you speak for Dr. Langer tonight on what he might be saying? <laughs> I said I think I just did. <laughs> I, I think he's a big believer in, in, in delivery as, as being one of the grand challenges in, in medicine in, in general um, and, and being able to structure things properly. I'll, I'll give you another example. I, I, think, I think what's, what's coming uh, is what I like to refer to as rational vaccinology. And this connects to something Shirley Ann and I were involved with when, 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 when we were uh, part of PCAST. Our first report was actually on vaccines. Uh, if you look at how we develop vaccines today, it's remarkable how crude of an operation it really is. You basically try to find something that will stimulate the immune system and you couple it with something that will train the immune system. And you take that mixture and you co-inject it uh, in the form of a, a, a shot. Uh, and it turns out that, that in many cases it actually works quite well. It can be refined using that particular approach. Um, we think that there's a much better way. Uh, and not just for vaccines, but for immunotherapy agents and, and, and medicines in general. And that is that it's not just good enough to have the right components. How you put the components together and how you present them will make a big difference in terms of how they interact with the right types of cells and how they trigger uh, the right types of pathways. And so in this idea of rational vaccinology, the idea is that components are not 
just important. It's how you build that structure on the length scale of biology that matters, how you present those different components to get the effect that you want. And we now can take systems, vaccine components, and we can look at different variations of these. And we have, in one case, a system that has all the right components. And you would say, hey, that, that should work as a vaccine, and it's mildly effective. Restructured on the nanoscale and presented properly, you go from mildly effective to completely curative in the case of a, 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 a cancer-type vaccine. I think that's a really empowering type of, of concept and one that is going to drive a lot of therapeutic development in the years to come. And, and that's an example of, I think, where, where, where you know, materials, nanomaterials in this case, where you understand structure-function relationships, the basic science of it, uh, can, can ultimately lead to big medical benefits. Also, Bob has a sweet tooth, so he would ask us where the chocolate was. Yeah. <laughs> well, I can't add very much to what has been said already, other than I don't think we should forget that Bob Langer has been an awesome mentor. Very important. Yeah, and, and I guess not, not just to be uh, glib, he also, I think, we, we, t we touched, I think, on tonight on entrepreneurship, but I think Bob is really, um, uh, his track record in this area is just Second phenomenal. And I'll, I'll say something that, that Sangita said. He, he actually sent an apology note. He, he, he says in his entire career, I actually believe him, says he's never missed, never missed a, talk. a talk. So this was not, oh, I, I, I was too busy, I couldn't make it. I mean, he, he really got uh, a snafu in this case. And, and, and I believe that because the guy's the most organized person on earth and, and <laughs> most responsive person on earth. Indeed. I kid my wife that I can text him at, at uh, 2 o'clock in the morning and he responds. You text him at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, he responds. He just seems to be that type of person. Like yourself, John. Yeah. Well, I learned from him. I learned from him. I learned from him. Yeah. Uh, so this is a question uh, for Chad, but also the rest of the panel as well. Um, so Chad, you highlighted the, uh, the startups that grew out of all the discoveries that was made in, in U-Labs. And this is a question on behalf of those of us who are passionate about research, but also are eager on uh, turning our research into impacts and values outside the lab. Do you think there's a way to create a meaningful career by balancing the two? And what would a institution like Northwestern do um, to support that kind of aspiration? Oh, I mean, I, I think there's absolutely, I mean, many, many people have made a career based upon that. So, so the, there are a couple things Northwestern's doing. One is, you, know, you have to be trained well from a, a science or engineering standpoint, and, and, and we do a good job at that. Many universities do a good job at that. But you're given uh, many uh, opportunities to engage in entrepreneurial activities here. Uh, we have uh, something called the garage, which is located nearby here, which has been, it's literally right in the parking garage, but it's a, a spot in the first level that is just for uh, uh, students and, and, and postdocs that have uh, uh, an interest in, in taking something at Northwestern and turning it into a company. Um, and we've started a company there with a, a few students uh, recently called TerraPrint uh, that now is uh, transitioning into a, a company that's actually doing quite well that makes uh, scientific instrumentation for, for nanoprinting. Um, uh, there are many activities, and, 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 and Fraser or, 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 or a few others have, have, have talked about the importance of connections and, and interactions between <coughs> different disciplines. Uh, even Kellogg has been a great partner uh, in the development of nanotechnology on campus. The first company I started, Nanosphere, I had no idea how to start a company. I, I, I walked into Kellogg and started knocking on doors and, and asking people, you know, yeah, how, how, do you, how do you do this? And I ran into a guy named uh, Barry Merkin. No relation. <laughs> he spelled his last name differently. But I said, Cousin Barry, you and I are going to be friends. Uh, and, and, and he ran the, ran the, uh, the entrepreneurial course here. And, and I said, you know, we have this incredible hub of science and engineering. And you have supposedly one of the best business schools on, on earth. Why aren't we connected? Why don't we ask your students, instead of writing hypothetical business plans, because that was one of the activities, get them interfaced with the scientists and engineers and medical doctors and begin to write real business plans based upon inventions that came out of this. And that started what we call the SB program. And that became a routine way of giving the, the, the Kellogg folks uh, access to the high tech uh, part of the university that they normally didn't interact with and giving the high-tech folks access to Kellogg, which they normally didn't interact with. And it's become a really important part of the culture here and continues today. 
And so we, we constantly have uh, students that are engaged in, in these types of activities and they often then become part of the companies because they've researched it, they've become passionate about it and, and they look like they can contribute. And, and so there are many uh, examples of that where uh, people started in the trenches and kind of worked their way through and used their expertise because it requires many, as we've heard, to, to be successful. And uh, uh, they ultimately uh, become part of that enterprise and run with it. Hi, uh, Professor Bhatia. Uh, you mentioned earlier the importance of diversity. And I was uh, nice. hoping you could talk a little bit more about what science can do to improve representation and making sure that these voices can be heard. I can't quite see you, so I'm looking generally towards the light. Oh, we hear you. Yes, I hear you. Um, so I, I think that's a great question. So I, I think just to frame the, the challenge of, um, of diversification of, of science, um, there's something called a pipeline that people say is leaking. So the leaky pipeline is the flow of talent um, all the way through the system. Um, and people can drop out of the pipeline at various points. So for young girls, for example, middle school is when the pipeline starts to leak. Um, for underrepresented minorities, it can be um, at, at different phases. And there's a, there's a cut at college and another at graduate school and faculty and leadership and entrepreneurship and all these other levels. So um, the first thing that we can do is publicly engage um, to make science accessible and to be visible role models and to encourage the excitement about science. So that's the first thing. Um, the next thing is to create curricula and inspired teachers um, to keep these people going through the system. Um, the, the third thing is actually to really encourage institutional change, and this is something that has happened in the last sort of 10 to 15 years, where we watch out for things like unconscious bias, um, which is uh, systemic in all of our institutions, um, and make sure that people get interviewed and evaluated fairly and encouraged and mentored all the way through the system. Um, and then uh, and finally, I think the, uh, the, the very last sort of pinnacle of it is, is the National Academies. Um, where we really actually still need to work incredibly hard to increase the recognition of the workforce um, in science. So the National Academy of Engineering right now is 7% women. Um, so you know, we, we have, a, have a long way to go. Um, but there are actually a lot of best practices that are available all over the web. The NSF, for example, has a program called the Advanced Program, where they actually created a whole bunch of best practices that you can just look up and, and institutionalize. Um, and, um, and actually, there, there are many folks here on the panel who have done a lot of this work um, and are, it's sort of like you have to keep fighting the good fight, um, but we're getting there. And I would just like to put in um, a word for the Nobel Foundation. Didn't they do a spectacular job this year <laughs> by choosing a Canadian physicist from yeah, Waterloo yeah. and uh, the very first That's American right. woman yes. to win a Nobel Prize Frances Arnold, she uh, deserves a big round of applause. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, it's an amazing panel. It's very inspiring. So I have a twofold question. One is in the national contest. I'm assuming this nano field requires a lot of instruments, perhaps expensive ones, a few hundred dollars or something. <laughs> yeah. And so how do you keep up this uh, upkeep? Because everything is moving so fast. And then also could you comment on the international scene and global scene and how we fare? And is there a need for cooperation, coordination across the world? Well, that's, that's Kevin. I'll take that because it's a set up question because he, he runs our facility here at Northwest. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's probably, the, I, I think, one of the best, of the best electron microscopists in the country. And, and, and he knows better than anybody that uh, you know, the key to this field, the key to really any cutting edge field is staying on top in terms of, of, of technology and analytical characterization. Um, so uh, even though you acquire great instruments uh, and great capabilities, you have to do that again in another five years to, to, to stay competitive. And, and, and this is a field where uh, the smaller you go, the more expensive it gets. Uh, we just installed a, a Titan microscope that uh, I'm sure Jay's still checking his wallet. Uh, cost a ridiculous amount of money, but it's, it, it, it puts you in a position to look at materials and characterize them in unique ways. And, and, and you have to build, in, any, in building any sort of organization, you have to really not only look at the people, not only look at the great buildings, but how do you constantly keep that instrumentation cutting edge? 
because uh, uh, you'll lose position rapidly. And the way we've done it is, one, building this big operation, centralized facilities like the one uh, he runs, um, so that everybody can benefit from them, and then getting uh, major government organizations, philanthropists, uh, to, to step up and, and help keep us incredibly competitive. And it, it's been a, a good journey. And I've always said that it's much easier to raise you know, large amounts of money if you're a billion dollar operation as opposed to a bunch of fractured one million dollar operations. And so that, that's always been kind of the strategy that we've had in play here. And it's one that we're constantly dealing with and, and trying to struggle with because it's critical to staying at the top of your game. I just like to add something that puts it in much more general context. Um, I was uh, brought up on a farm south of Edinburgh in Scotland. Um, there was no electricity until I was 18. Uh, and we went from 1942 from horses and cars to 1968. It was a tenant farm when my parents uh, decided to leave uh, because I had left. Um, to combine harvesters and balers and very sophisticated equipment. And I learned during that first 25 years that, because uh, I could see the farmers who failed and the farmers who succeeded, that um, there was no truck with uh, not keeping up with all the modern technology that came on the scene. So if a new implement uh, to do something on the farm appeared, my father was in there and we got it. And you never let, uh, within reason, Jay, money get in the way. <laughs> um, you just get it and worry about pay for, paying for it afterwards. And that, that's a very important spirit, I think, through all of science. And uh, I've always uh, you know, taken that uh, lesson from my upbringing on the farm. If you want to survive, and more than that, if you want to be at the head of the, uh, as it were, uh, pack, then you must have all these new techniques come on board as fast as possible. Hmm. And I have to say that these are not exaggerated stories because uh, I once, Fraser knows this, I once gave a talk in Canada and I met the man who he delivered milk to from his farm, <laughs> which is remarkable in, in itself. <laughs> that, that, uh, uh, Fraser worked his way up from the milk boy to Nobel Prize winner. Thank you for being here and all your labor in such an interesting field. I'm wondering if anyone knows of any research being done in this field on the International Space Station, in other words, in a micro microgravity environment. There, there are experiments. I'm, I'm not that familiar with them. A lot of it has to do with uh, crystallization. It turns out crystalliza crystallization processes are... <laughs> Uh, no gravity type environments, um, but we're not engaged in those, so I can't really comment in any great detail. So thank you so much for everything that you've said tonight. Um, but in a way, you've almost made what you do look easy. So speaking from uh, the point of a grad student here, we know that it's not always easy. So could you speak to a challenge that you've had to uh, overcome in your career? This is for all of you. <laughs> well, I, I, I can take this one up. I mean, I've had many challenges, but the one I would pick out is the fact that in 1992, while I was still in the UK, my wife was diagnosed with breast cancer, and that year uh, we um, <coughs> saw her have a lumpectomy. The um, disease, which had not been caught early enough, and uh, this is some commentary, I think, on the health service there at the time, um, led to a mastectomy in 94. And uh, this was part of the reason why, come 97, having had two or three offers to go to UCLA from uh, Birmingham in the UK, that um, I decided, uh, because of my wife's health, and she was uh, very much, uh, as it were, happy to uh, hear the uh, sort of uh, talk that came from the UCLA Breast Cancer Center, which was very different from what we heard in the UK. <coughs> they just looked at her and said, look, we, you have a, 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 
chronic disease. We have 50 different ways of treating it. So this raised her spirits. And uh, it, it was remarkable. She lived for uh, another 12 years. Uh, but I do want to point out that for a third of our married life and for a fifth of her life, we were battling with this insidious disease. And so it was a huge challenge to me to keep uh, my research group going through the period from 92 to 2004. And I had to um, get my mind into a situation where um, there was the one that was in clinics and hospitals, and I probably spent at least a third of my time in those environments uh, through that 12-year uh, period. And the rest of the time where I had the escape of going to the laboratory with my students and being able ultimately to switch off in relation to uh, this insidious disease that we were grappling with as a family. And, um, you know, I just look back on it and say um, it was a remarkable time. And I don't think uh, uh, that uh, it's a difficult one to beat in terms of uh, the uh, human aspect of it, the personal aspect of uh, keeping your research program going under such a cloud, such a black cloud. So I, I think my students know this because um, I, I, I tell them this to motivate them. Um, science is a very, uh, by design, uh, adversarial type of, of, of profession in the sense that you get to the um, right answer if, if you do science well by challenging, challenging, challenging. Don't believe you know, what you want things to be. You know, figure out what the real truth is. And uh, scientists tend to be very critical, and I think even more critical a few decades ago than they are today. Things have kind of softened a little bit, but I was here at Northwestern in my fourth year, and I'd applied for grant after grant, and I got a review for an NSF grant, um, and the review went something like this. Uh, Chad Merkin's been at Northwestern for four years, He's done nothing of import. I see no reason why the federal government should give him another penny. Now, that's the moment you talk about challenge. You have to, you know, how, how do you respond to that? Well, you could go mope and shake your head and say, you know, or you could say, this person's wrong. I went outside and posted it outside my door for every student to see. And I said, that's why I come to work every day, to prove people like that wrong. And you have to kind of believe in what you want to do in life and, and, and where you want to go. And I take feedback from everybody. You don't want to just block <coughs> reject uh, criticism. Uh, but you have to learn from it. And, and certain, some criticism is just not constructive. You push it off, and others you learn from and, and, and kind of build your path forward. And, and I think it's a critical part of any profession, but it's really important in science. You have to develop a thick skin. You have to be able to deal with things that aren't maybe said so nicely to you, and, and, and if you do, you'll, you'll go pretty far, I think, in this, in this business. If, if you don't, it's a rough life because it, uh, uh, scientists tend not to be shy about providing criticism. <laughs> well, I just add, I think it's very easy to manage success. It's much more difficult to manage failure. Uh, well said, yeah. And uh, as Chad is pointing out, both from the professional and from my side, I gave you the personal one, side of life. Life is not, unless you're incredibly lucky, a bowl of cherries. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to just add um, my story, which is, um, which is not so concrete. There's not a moment in time. But there's something called the imposter syndrome that people talk a lot about, um, where women in particular just feel like they don't belong. You know, and you can look at their credentials, and they have every right to be up there. Um, on the podium, but they have this sort of internal dialogue about, like, I'm going to be found out, and I'm not as good as everybody else. And I think especially early in my career, I, I definitely felt that. And um, you know, over time, you, you keep going, and you accumulate credentials, and you accomplish something, you push through a tough problem, and you convince yourself that based on the past that you can do it again, and you know what you're talking about. But I think I mean, honestly, I think I, I felt that for the first 20 years of my career. 
um, a really long time standing up on stage thinking like, oh my gosh, they're going to find out that I don't know everything. <laughs> so, so if you feel that it's totally normal, then it will, you will get past it someday. <laughs> So uh, thank you for uh, sharing all the uh, great things created by nanotechnology, uh, which also like uh, addresses a lot of uh, challenges in the society. But I'm curious, like, what do you think could be the potential challenges or problems created by nanotechnology? For example, new types of pollution, their interaction with human being, and uh, what do you think the community should do to address these things? So I mean that's actually a really good question, and there 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 are uh, groups at, at uh, universities and institutes that actually look at this. I think that what the NNI did, the National Nanotechnology Initiative, uh, w which was uh, uh, very smart early on, recognized that everything isn't a bowl of cherries. Uh, that when you develop a new field, you develop new technologies. You, there's the ability to do good. There's the ability to do bad, uh, and and there are unintended consequences, um, and especially in the case of environmental type issues, uh, they got ahead of it by starting centers that focused on looking at different types of materials and beginning to you know, challenge the idea that not everything is good. What are, what are the negative consequences of these? And I think we always have to do that. I don't think that should be something that stops progress, uh, but it's something that we should recognize. And anytime we have something that's new, especially in the medical arena, uh, we have to uh, uh, use a battery of tests uh, and, and, and a, a good scientific method applied towards trying to understand what are some of the negative consequences. The good news is that we have a lot of government agencies in addition to um, these centers that are around that take these and treat them. If you take a new nanomedicine, it's treated like a new drug. You look at, at the side effects, you take it into the clinic very slowly. Uh, you go through a process that uh, looks first at safety and then looks at efficacy. Uh, not perfect, uh, but, but uh, certainly uh, pretty darn good, and, and, and so far, you know, we haven't had, you know, major issues. There undoubtedly will be some issues, um, and I think it's, it's how we respond and how we minimize the effects that really will, you know, define how, how good we are at this. That's something we're going to learn, I think, over the next couple of decades. Maybe we should also add that uh, so much nanotechnology is also done in something called a clean room. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, a huge amount of uh, precautions are taken uh, through that early stage where people are uh, playing around with particles of different size and we don't know what their uh, repercussions are going to be. Uh, but by the time something comes out of the clean room, it's a product that uh, is a result of nanotechnology, but uh, let's just call it a new material. Um, as a HEMONC fellow that works downtown and as a nanoscientist myself, I get this question a lot. There's a lot of great nanoparticles that are complex and have really good preclinical data, but when you talk about it in clinical side, um, there's still a lot of confusion and resistance of using quite complex nanoparticles. What do you think are the major roadblocks and how can we you know, make that easier for clinical translation? Uh, I think that's actually a fallacy. I, I, I used to believe that too. I, I found that the FDA is actually very receptive to this. We now have four drugs in the clinic. Uh, we've taken numerous diagnostic tools uh, <coughs> and, and FDA tools as well. But four drugs in the clinic literally in the last 16 months uh, we're moving at a very rapid pace. I think the, the FDA wants to embrace this. What you have to do, and you kind of, you kind of uh, alluded to it, there are just enormous number of, of different types of structures that you can use in, in nanomedicine. The vast majority of them will never see the light of day. They'll be parts of papers, but they'll never be developed uh, into the clinic, let, let alone you know, through preclinical, pre the right types of preclinical studies to validate them. Part of the reason is you have to be able to define the structures well for the FDA. You have to be able to say this is what we have and we can make it in mass and we can make it under GMP compliant good manufacturing practice type conditions and very few of the materials fit that bill. So if you want to go down that path, you have to think from the start, if I have something I think is really good, how do I begin to grapple with that? How do I begin to scale these types of materials? How do I be able to you know, reliably synthesize and characterize them? Because they want to know what you're injecting in patients. 
uh, and build that infrastructure from the start. What a lot of people do is they go through this, they get a really cool paper, they think they have something really great, but they haven't given any thought to this process. And those are the people that run into a big problem because the FDA is not going to let you take something really ill-defined and, and put it in people. I agree. <laughs> Hi. All of you today talked about breaking down silos that divide scientists. How do we break down yeah. barriers in communicating science to the public, especially when it comes to subjects like the environment and health? I think you do what's going on right up here. I, I, I said this on PCAST a long time ago. I think you, uh, the, the, the whole problem with uh, uh, environmental science and uh, uh, the political divide that we have is that I think it should be discussed more with the general public. I think there should be uh, open uh, forums where you can aggressively ask questions and, and look at the responses and then judge for yourself. Um, and, and to me, communication is really, really uh, important in this, and, and, and I think scientists can do a better job at making sure that communication is, is out there for not just their group, uh, not just their friends, but for really everybody who has a, an interest in, yeah. in this area. And, and I think we'd go a lot further in, in getting a uh, more educated response. I agree with that. One of the things that we do, and um, I run a center for, for nanomedicine at my place, um, for the postdocs is actually um, teach them about science communication and how to communicate their science. Um, and I think it's not, it's not um, something that you learn about um, necessarily in your career. It's to talk to non-experts about it. Um, and I, I think that even as, as faculty, we, it's a muscle that we can exercise. And so, you know, I think we've seen many of us have given TED Talks and, you know, there's a whole, I, I remember telling the um, TED producers, okay, I want to talk about nanotechnology. So, okay, they said to me like, okay, we can't see it. <laughs> like, how are you going to visualize it? So we made an animation um, because I didn't want to strip the content, you know, and so I think we have to push the community to understand. We have to teach the public what we are working on so they can understand. And so part of um, the, as, as educators is teaching scientists to educate the public. I would just maybe be a bit controversial now by saying uh, I think there's so much we can do and I think uh, this evening is a great example of what we can do. But if we're going to be self-critical maybe we're in an echo chamber. And what is alarming me is that in the Western world, I think at the moment we're living, we scientists and engineers and well-educated people in an echo chamber. And um, we are not managing to reach out to uh, the populace at large. I mean, I'm not a social scientist and so I can't put my finger on all the reasons. But I do travel the world. Uh, I have no option now after that uh, message of uh, 2016 on the 5th of October. And <laughs> what I can tell you is that the uh, enthusiasm and passion for science in a place like China, a little in Korea, Japan, Singapore, has no equal here in the Western world, here in the United States, Canada. I've been in uh, <coughs> Brazil, um, a lot more there than maybe than here, uh, and, and also Europe is a complete disaster uh, in many ways. Uh, how, how could I express this? Um, if I'm somewhere in China and I've given a talk, and recently I can remember actually being in fear of my life, I was pinned up against a wall. And all I could see was this huge semicircle of young people with um, <coughs> their um, iPhones and the equivalent thereof, uh, taking photographs and demanding selfies and so forth and autographs. And I felt my <coughs> body being physically uh, you know, compressed against this wall. This doesn't happen here in the Western world. And <coughs> Whatever we might say about the political scene in China, I've had 90 minutes with the Premier of China back on the 20th of January, and you can think about the significance of that day, 2017. 
and I'm told that uh, I'm going to, somewhere between the 9th and the 11th of January, have an equivalent amount of time with the um, president of China, President Xi, who incidentally is a graduate of Tsinghua University in chemical engineering, having majored in organic chemistry, and also with uh, Premier Li, who is a graduate of Peking University in economics. I have not heard a cheep from the First Minister of Scotland. These two gentlemen have 1.38 billion people to worry about. Nicola Sturgeon only has 5.5 million. Quite a contrast there. It is remarkable. I, I, I took my niece to China once. The, 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 how much that population embraces science, respects science, it, it's, it's just incredible. I mean, you have a room like this, tw twice the size of this, filled with people. It would not pass our fire code. There'd be people standing in, in, in the aisles. And I had my niece with me, and we looked up at the audience, and she goes, God, she goes, I think these people like you more here than they do back home. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I think you're right. <laughs> uh, but it, it, it's, it's just a, an unbelievable, because they understand that, that, that this is the route to uh, all the things that we enjoy, um, all the technology that we, we heard about, all the incredible things that I think we take for granted now. But uh, we'd better pick it up. So Chad, at the end of May, I think, uh, you weren't able to go and uh, receive your um, parchment and so forth as a foreign member of the Chinese Academy of Sciences. I had spare time, so I was able to go. <laughs> <laughs> President Xi spoke in the great hall of the people to, I think, somewhere between seven and 10,000. Uh, let's say 95% were probably under the age of 22 for 70 minutes on science and technology. You tell me about any leader in the Western world who could match that uh, situation? Um, we all talk a lot tonight uh, about how nanotechnology is about making different connections between fields and that leads to a much higher complexity of the field and how to cope with it. And I like to understand uh, how you guys see, well, we're saying this from a perspective of somebody who s went from just being a chemist to an age where you now you have to be not only a chemist but also a computer scientist, an engineer, and all this, this multi-dimensional uh, person. So for somebody who saw this evolving is one thing. How do you see from somebody who's just arrived in the field now that you have all this complexity going on and how to adapt to this? I think there's a little distinction. I, I, I don't think you have to be an expert in all of those. You have to be an exper expert in one of those and appreciate all the others. Uh, because as we talked about, a lot of, of what we do and a lot of the field relies on <coughs> groups of people together. So you have to know what's out there. You have to know the capabilities. I, I don't think you want to be a, a jack of all trades. But you want to appreciate all trades and you want to bring uh, the different components together required to solve the problem you're trying to solve. Uh, so that's what I think the challenge is for, for you know, young people going forward. It's a, a very different game. You need to become an expert in one area, but you need to be somewhat knowledgeable about the different things that are available to you outside of your area if you really want to capitalize on many of the things that we talked about today. I mean, I guess another way of putting it, Chad, would be networking is incredibly important. I would almost go as far as to say during my scientific career that networking and collaboration has been the secret to success. And, you know, let me couple that with you really have got to come to your uh, basic field of science not feeling that you're giving anything away if you start to bring in other people to uh, embellish the actual project that you're working on at that particular time. Never give that a thought. Just think, how many more people could I bring in to give us better understanding of this uh, particular project before hopefully we submit it to somewhere like science or nature? Um, not that that's the be-all or end-all, but um, you should use that as a criterion, I think, uh, about um, 
getting the very best out of your science. Just reach out until you have all the expertise and that expertise has commented on every aspect of the problem that you can think of and don't for a minute think that it dilutes your uh, contribution. And I think just to follow up on that, sometimes it's not, um, I mean, it, it will feel like, maybe it would feel like networking later, but in the beginning it's just curiosity. You know, you're just talking to other colleagues about what they're doing. And, um, you know, th those are the connections actually that, that are often the most fruitful. I mean, if you have a center of gravity, like Chad mentioned, um, and so I, for example, love the liver. I've been in love with the liver my whole career. And so I see liver disease everywhere. You tell me about whatever your project is and I'll say like, oh, this would be good for this liver disease. So it's great to have an anchor and be out in the world and, and, and just be curious. Um, and they, they will turn into your sort of, your, the halo around you of connections. That, that, that's well put. Curiosity is, uh, well, the mother of invention, absolutely. Okay, well I think that is a terrific note to end on. I think we should thank our panelists for uh, just a fantastic discussion. Um, but this is a discussion that can continue. Uh, we're now going to have a reception. All of the panelists will be sticking around. All of our distinct, distinguished guests will be here. Um, so we definitely welcome everyone to, to stay. Uh, have, have some refreshments and let's keep going with the discussion. Thank you.